My name is uh, Garth Stevens. I'm a professor of psychology under normal circumstances, but I'm here tonight, of course, as the, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities. And it is also my pleasure to welcome you all here this evening as family, as friends, colleagues, members of the BITS community, uh, especially, of course, also uh, Professor Zhuang, Roberts, Morris, but I suppose most importantly this evening is about Professor Thurman. So a very, very special welcome to you, Professor Thurman. Uh, as Professor Morris has indicated, this is really a celebratory moment. It's a celebratory moment insofar as this is really the apex of a career. And it's, an, it's the apex in terms of ranking in, in an institution. And so we are really looking forward to the kind of presentation that you're going to be doing this evening, Chris. By way of introduction, I'm gonna get straight into it. Chris Thurman is a professor of English and director of the Tsikinia Chaka Center in the School of Literature, Language and Media at Wits University. He joined Wits as a lecturer in 2008 after being awarded his PhD by the University of Cape Town. Prior to this, he completed an MA at Royal Holloway University of London and a BA Honours degree at Rhodes University. During the course of his career at BITS, Chris has of course served as the Assistant Dean for Graduate Studies uh, in the Faculty of Humanities and also as the Head of the English Department. Professor Thurman is President of the Shakespeare Society of Southern Africa and founder of the online resource Shakespeare ZA. He has edited the journal Shakespeare in Southern Africa since 2009 and he's also an arts columnist for the Business Day. His books include the monograph of Guy Butler, Reassessing a South African Literary Life in 2010, and two collections of his arts writing, At Large, Reviewing the Arts in South Africa in 2012, and Still at Large, Dispatches from South Africa's Frontiers of Politics and Art in 2017. As editor, he has published Text Bites, an anthology, of high schools, an anthology for high schools in 2009, and two collections of essays, Sport versus Art, a South African contest in 2010, and South African essays on Universal Shakespeare in 2014. A third collection of essays, Global Shakespeare and Social Injustice Towards a Transformative Encounter, co-edited with Sandra Young, is forthcoming with Arden Bloomsbury. Professor Thurman is an NRF rated scholar and his research is supported by grants from the National Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences and the Mellon Program in Digital, African Digital Humanities. He's the recipient of the Witz Friedel Saltshop Award and the English Academy's Thomas Pringle Prize for reviews. He's a fellow of the Humboldt Foundation and the principal investigation of the Humboldt Research Group Linkage Program project titled African Shakespeare's Translating the Texts, Transforming the Field. It is my pleasure, uh, Professor Thurman, to invite you now to deliver your inaugural lecture title, The Play in South Africa Towards the Translation History of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Who was it who started the applause? <laughs> Thank you, Annalisa. Resident artist at the Tsikina Shaka Center for 2022, Annalisa Pera, was not paid to do that. I do want to start with some thank yous. First of all, to the technical team, we had a run through this afternoon and after two years of pandemic era um, technical glitches, which I'm, all sh I'm sure we've all experienced trying to run Zoom webinars from our uh, bedrooms at home. It was such a thrill to come in and have a dedicated team uh, helping with the professional setup to make it possible for us to be in person and, and online. So thank you uh, very much to you. And thank you also to Kele Bukhile Tadi, who's uh, been a wonderful uh, organizer of this event. You all know her name well now, having received lots of emails from her. Thank you especially to Professors Stevens, Ojuan and, and Morris. Um, it's not very cool in uh, a university to admit that you like and admire your line managers. You're supposed to be a bit more jaundiced in your views of them. Um, so I shouldn't be too effusive in my praise, but uh, yeah, I'm very appreciative of the support that I've received from you. And thank you for that. Um, 
also to uh, Professor Robert, Sarah, there's nobody better placed than you to comment on what I have to say. Uh, and thanks also to my, my head of department, Dr. Sophia Kostelak and my English department colleagues and those colleagues from the School of Literature, Language and Media. It's a great uh, privilege to have you all here and I look forward to seeing you afterwards. So as Prof. Morris has, has indicated, the inaugural lecture is a tricky genre because as I understand it, uh, I have to tell you what I've been doing, what I have been professing to reach this point and what I plan to do from here on. Um, I have to demonstrate my expertise in a highly specific niche area. Um, and uh, I also possibly have to present a bold new theory that'll change my field, something for future scholars to puzzle over. Um, and at the same time, I also have to talk about uh, something that's very accessible uh, and not too difficult for a non-specialist audience. Um, so I'm not entirely sure if we'll achieve that. I hope to entertain you. You might not get J.M. Kutsia talking about Rousseau's Confessions. It's an in-joke for people in the literary critical field, um, but I'll, I'll try my best. Let me say, however, that I really am delighted by the range of people who are here this evening, uh, both in person and, and online. To each of you, I owe sincere thanks, not just for being here, but for the many ways in which you have contributed to and supported my work as a scholar, family and friends and colleagues and students. It's truly humbling. Um, can I quickly check if uh, we're okay with the slides? Because I'm going to be clicking through some slides shortly. Folks at home, are you seeing that? I'm sure you are. Okay, so there's my title slide. Um, I will be doing some shameless promoting of the Tsukinia Shaka Center during the course of this talk. Um, uh, and uh, a comment that I should make briefly about my title is that although it's an annoying academic habit of inserting punctuation where it doesn't seem necessary in titles, um, it is quite important for us to mark the slippage between South Africa and Africa that is, is indicated by those parentheses. Um, so I'll be discussing that uh, during the course of the talk. And although it seems like a very bland title, a play in South Africa, what I'm trying to do really in this talk is to dial down a certain amount of enthusiasm about Julius Caesar in, uh, in South Africa. Um, and instead to dial up enthusiasm about uh, other aspects of this play and its history uh, and a Shakespearean African context more, more generally. Um, so uh, if it seems a little bit dull, um, that's, that's partly deliberate. The, the title that is, not the talk. So uh, let's look at some pictures. On your right-hand side there, uh, you see two texts that have been digitized and are currently available for public download and uh, fully digitally searchable via Shakespeare ZA through a digitization project that we started. The top one is Julius Caesar, the Shitsonga translation by Samuel Beloy. Uh, and the bottom one, a uh, much more famous, Din Choncho Tsabo Julius Kesara, the uh, Setswana translation by Sol Plaiki. Um, and in the smaller, or the, the, the box of four to the left of those two uh, are four texts that have uh, yet to be uh, digitized, but they are um, heading that way soon, including the one on the bottom left, Julia Caesar, uh, B.B.M. Gledley's Isikosa translation, uh, which I'll be talking about this evening. So keep those images and those covers in mind um, while, I'm, while I'm discussing these translations. So the story so far is part one of this lecture. Um, that's not just uh, the history of the claim that Julius Caesar is Shakespeare's African play, which you've read about in the, in the um, abstract for this talk. Um, but it's also the story of the various scholars uh, who have written about this history and some of the related material that I'll be discussing tonight. So for those in the audience uh, who know something about Shakespeare in South Africa or have read any of my work before, uh, the next few minutes may feel like ground that's already been covered in the critical literature. For those who don't know anything about the play Julius Caesar, don't worry, I'll share the key plot points a little bit later on. Um, so when we look at uh, point number two, the case for the idea of Shakespeare's African play being Julius Caesar, and the, then after that, the case against this idea, it's not just a question of Chris Thurman railing, railing about uh, Utata John Carney, but uh, it's also a wider body of work, articles and essays by a range of 
exceptional South African Shakespeare scholars. And I don't mind mentioning their names, uh, including people like Lawrence Wright, Natasha de Stiller, David Skulkveik, Sandra Young, Daniel Rue, Colette Gordon, uh, and others. So the first three uh, points there are really prefaced to the fourth, uh, which is what I am trying to promote, a return of the focus to translators and to their translations, um, which is a project uh, that I'm hoping will end in at least one book, maybe a few, uh, a research and, and creative collaboration um, that challenges the claim that Julius Caesar is Shakespeare's African play, uh, but also um, digs deeper into the history uh, of, of that claim and uh, tries to find a little bit of nuance and complexity between the case for and the case against this claim. So before we go any further, a couple of historical markers to bear in mind. Um, I'll be referring to some of these translations in my story so far, and I'll come back to them in my concluding remarks. I've mentioned 1937, Sol Plaiki Setswana translation. Uh, that was published posthumously. Plaiki died in 1932. Um, and it wasn't his first published Shakespeare translation. That was uh, Di Porsche Porsche, The Comedy of Errors, in 1930. Um, if you don't know who Sol Plaiki is, uh, I would highly encourage you to go home this evening and do some reading. A really interesting figure in South Africa's history, uh, one of the founding members of the ANC, um, a, a multilingual, um, almost I want to say a polymath, maybe that's making the case a bit too strongly, uh, but a quite brilliant person who also is compromised, I think uh, when we look at him from the perspective of the 21st century, by his strident support for the British Empire, which makes him a really complicated figure. Um, so uh, that's one of our pointers. Um, it's also worth mentioning that that, that text uh, has a bit of an institutional connection. It was published by Wits University Press. Um, it was heavily edited and in fact revised uh, by GP Lestrade or Lestrade, depending on how you prefer to say his Dutch surname, um, who was uh, chair of, of Bantu languages at the University of Cape Town and elsewhere. And some of the controversy around that publication history is of interest to us. By the way, I'm experiencing a very slight echo. Is everybody okay with the sound? I'm happy, thank you. Okay, so our second text, I've also pointed to that one, um, Bennett Best and Gledler's Isikosa translation of uh, Julius Caesar. Um, this features centrally in our story, but let me get out of the way the important anecdote, um, which John Carney often tells, which is that as a schoolboy in the Eastern Cape in the late 1950s, um, he encountered this play, or Julius Caesar, by BBM Dedley, and he was absolutely rapt. He thought this was the most brilliant thing uh, that he had in, that he had read. And it was only some months or years later when he encountered Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar, that he realized that it was a translation. Uh, and he felt that Shakespeare's play failed by comparison to kind of capture the, uh, the beauty and the, and the poetry of, of Ngledle's uh, Iskosa. Um, so, of course, there's a, there's a bit of actor's uh, exaggeration and license in, in Kani's story, and he loves telling it and retelling it. Um, but uh, it's, as you can imagine, for someone in my position, a really useful way of thinking about the relationship between putative original texts, so-called original texts, and their, and their translations. And then our third key point or key text is Julius Nyerere's Kiswahili translation, Juliasi Kaisari. Um, that was published in 1963. Uh, this was the age of independence for many African nations. Um, Nyerere, of course, was the first, uh, first the prime minister and the president of uh, Tanzania. Um, and his translation is really important when we think about the, uh, the status of Kiswahili as a language in the East African region. Um, so when I talk about these translations, at least you know when, when they came out. Um, and also just to flag, what we have here is something like a, a pan-African history, which is something I'm going to be emphasizing during the course of my, of my talk. So I'm, I'm both uh, focusing, I suppose, on, on South African texts because that's been my uh, own um, area of interest over the past few years, uh, but I want to gesture towards uh, a, a pan-African history. Uh, and in doing so, I'll talk about some of the, the colleagues and the scholars that I work with who uh, work in that area. So the story so far, here's the rest of the story so far. Uh, Julius Caesar is quite simply Shakespeare's African play, uh, a quote that you uh, can Google and will find uh, 
emerging in many different iterations, perhaps most recently in Patterson Joseph's memoir, Julius Caesar and Me, published in 2018. Um, now, Patterson Joseph played Brutus, we'll talk just now about who Brutus is, uh, in a Royal Shakespeare Company production of Julius Caesar that was directed by Gregory Doran in uh, 2012, Doran. And uh, this production, I think, was a really interesting experiment, but um, a bad idea, to put it crudely. And I've written about this probably more than I should have. Um, what Doran did was partly to overcome the uh, problems of casting and race in a British context. Uh, and so as a kind of valuable intervention in terms of the British theatre scene, was to cast a production of Julius Caesar uh, where the cast was entirely made up of black British actors. Um, but what they did was to pretend that they were in an either East African or West African, depending on which way the accents drifted, um, African context in post-independence Africa in the 1960s. Um, and so what you had was a group of British actors uh, pretending to be African, um, which some have suggested is a, is a form of kind of, one almost wants to say a verbal blackface for want of a, of a better phrase. Um, so it's complicated uh, terrain. But what's interesting about that production is that it was authorized uh, in the billing and in lots of the branding and the advertising material by Greg Doran quoting John Carney with whom he'd worked on many occasions previously saying Julius Caesar is Shakespeare's African play. And I too am complicit in this process because in 2009 I interviewed uh, Utata Kani for uh, The Tempest when he was performing with Anthony Scher, the late Anthony Scher in The Tempest in Cape Town. And he told me some of these stories about Bibi Mgledle and Julius Caesar. Um, and I was wowed as one is when one is in such a presence. Uh, and so I sort of hopped on the, on the bandwagon. If we go further back in time, luckily I wasn't the first David Blair writing for The Telegraph. That should tell you everything you need to know from the publication he was writing for. Um, uh, recycled this story, uh, but also gestured towards a period in the distant halcyon days of the mid 1990s. Uh, when uh, John Carney first made this connection or made this claim um, in a point of conflict with uh, Janet Sussman, who of course uh, directed him in the famous production of Othello. Um, and so Carney's a really interesting figure here because part of his provocation to Sussman is to say, uh, why can't I speak to you any closer? Why do we have to be so Anglophile and Anglophone? Um, but he also, according to David Blair's claim, uh, first then you know, made this assertion about Julius Caesar being Shakespeare's African play and the rest is history. Um, so what I suppose I partly want to do is to caution against the sitting comfortably in the terrain of apocrypha and anecdote. Um, I'm much more interested in actual and accurate textual history in theater history and in, as I'll pursue later, specifically translation history. Um, so on the point of theater history, uh, as I look at Annalisa sitting there, a footnote. Um, those of you who know me will know that I've uh, spent quite a lot of time over the past few years trying to pretend that I know something about theater and easing myself out of a literary critical role into something of a, a sort of fanboy of theater makers. Um, and I am actually more interested in theater history, I think, at the moment than in textual history when it comes to Shakespeare. Um, but this talk is very much about, about texts. So I just want to flag uh, the work of Marguerite Duval, who has just produced a really brilliant PhD thesis that I was fortunate to supervise, where she has done some of this work unearthing uh, kind of forgotten moments in South African uh, performance history. Um, for example, at the Windy Brow Theater, not too far away, uh, in the 1990s, there was, there was a spate of performances, a kind of, for a brief period of time, a performance tradition of annual productions of Julius Caesar. And I think that would be a really interesting way of testing some of the claims about how the play Julius Caesar lands in a South African context. But that will have to remain a footnote for now. Uh, so let's go further backwards. Carney was not the first and certainly not the only one to make this claim about Julius Caesar as Shakespeare's African play. And I promise you, if you're still wondering what the hell is Julius Caesar about, I will get there. But we're just gonna cover some more terrain and then we'll talk about the play itself. Um, so uh, over the past few decades, many people have followed Carney's lead. Uh, but prior to that, some decades beforehand, we can trace the claim a little further back. The great Kenyan scholar, uh, and writer Ali Alamin Mazri 
1967, wrote two essays in his collection, The Anglo-African Commonwealth, uh, in which he wrote about Shakespeare in an African context. Um, and uh, he's writing, of course, about Julius Nyerere's famous translation of the play in, in 1963. So Masuri cites uh, Nyerere quoting from Julius Caesar in a pamphlet that he wrote, Barriers to Democracy, in his kind of more, let's say, revolutionary moment, right, prior to independence for what was then Tanganyika. Um, and the quotes that he, uh, that he provided, those of you who know the play will recognize them. There is a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Um, and then later on, men at some times are masters of their fates. These are lines that uh, characters speak early in the play when they are idealistically anticipating uh, a, a better Roman Republic, a better future for themselves and their fellow citizens and claiming this moment. Um, and that's, it's important that we think about, uh, about that mood of Julius Caesar, because there's a whole other bit of Julius Caesar, which does not confirm this mood at all. Um, so that's Masri uh, uh, staking that claim. He called it Nyerere's clarion call, um, expressing his political longings uh, for the people of then Tanganyika. Um, Masri also quotes uh, Ndabaningi Sitole uh, from then Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, um, who uh, wrote in his uh, book, African Nationalism in 1959, um, about what had already by then, as he perceived it, gone wrong with, with African liberation movements. And he quoted Julius Caesar as well. Um, the lines here, it is a common proof that lowliness is young ambition's ladder, where to the upward climber turns his face. It's a great speech that basically presents uh, political ambition uh, as being like somebody climbing a ladder. Uh, and so you look upwards as you climb the ladder uh, and you would think then maybe when you get to the top, you look downwards and you see those who have helped you up the ladder, but you don't, you kick the ladder in and you turn your face away from them. And this is uh, Sitole's uh, analogy for what happens with African national or African nationalist movements um, that uh, as he saw it then, in the, even in the 1950s, contemporary African nationalists were not recognizing those who had come before them. So these lines also come from the early scenes in the play, but they have more of a cynical shadow to them, um, a reminder that ambition usually leads to the end of equal alliances and to political idealism. Let's go further back and back to South Africa. Masuri wasn't the first. Uh, we can also look at this claim uh, coming from Kantemba a South African writer that most people nowadays would think of as a drum writer, along with the likes of Henry Nkumalo, Blok Modisane, Tot Machikisa, Casey Mutsitsi, Nat Nakasa, stop me if the names are ringing bells, Louis Nkosi is another name we'll hear about. Um, now, Ken Temba was a, was a short fictioneer, short story writer and a newspaper man. Uh, and thanks to Spiwo Mahala, uh, whose uh, book on Temba recently uh, was published, his work is being recognized anew. Um, but Tembo uh, wrote in that what we now see as a kind of recognizable uh, drum style uh, in an essay called Through Shakespeare's Africa, published in the New African in 1963. Um, and he said, it comes with little surprise that the starting point in the Shakespearean odyssey for many an African who has staggered through literacy is Julius Caesar. There is a translation in Tswana by Sol Plaiki, which loses nothing of that play's dynamism by giving it the Kotla atmosphere. But recently, a friend of mine who wanted to make it more contemporary told me the tale thus. So uh, Temba's already marking himself as distinct a generation later from Plaiki, who was uh, more interested in a so-called traditional African uh, context for his translation. Uh, and Temba says, well, let's think about Julius Caesar now in the 1960s. And so he produces this analogy where he basically explains political contestation in the then trans sky by giving all of the characters in Shakespeare's play um, South African names, calling them chieftains, uh, and he kind of makes this a familiar tale. He says, apparently Kaiser, Chief Kaiser MC had trampled down the haughty heads of most of the lesser chiefs in the trans sky and left them licking their bruised ambitions while he was climbing in the bunga to the leadership. Um, this of course invokes the kind of, what could we say, the, the sort of fake parliaments, I guess, the fake chieftains councils um, that, uh, uh, gave a certain amount of uh, limited power or the appearance of power and independence to what would become Bantustans. Um, so this chief was so widely acclaimed by the rabble in the world at large that many of these disgruntled chieftains murmured 
Why, man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and we petty men walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Um, those, of course, are lines spoken in complaint about Julius Caesar, this larger-than-life enormous man who takes all of the glory for himself. And so Temba then goes on to explain how, uh, if we think about the resentment towards Julius Caesar by some of the characters in the play who will later kill him, we should also mention not just the play, but in history, <laughs> as, we, as far as we know, um, uh, they, can, they can be understood to be like these uh, chieftains who have to kind of find ways of collaborating so that they can build consensus for the assassination. Um, okay, so uh, let's check where we are. There we go. So it's worth noting that all of these assertions about Julius Caesar have echoes in very similar claims that have been made about other Shakespeare plays in a South African and African context. And I could be here giving parallel lectures or I could be writing parallel essays about Macbeth and the Merchant of Venice in particular. We'll come back to those. So pity the second year students who I saw this afternoon in ENGL 2008A, uh, who have been doing exactly this recently and who have submitted unmarked essays uh, that are waiting for me on Ulwazi. Um, this, by the way, a, a colleague of mine, um, Sue Dipavine, who runs the Drama Factory in Somerset West, saw my slideshow over my shoulder and she said, you can't show that slide. It's just really not user friendly. And I said, that's the point, right? It's supposed to, I'm mocking, I suppose, the high uh, density text, high, high text uh, essay questions that I set my poor second years. So this is a public apology to the second years. But if you read the small print, you'll see there that many people have made similar claims about Macbeth, Titus Andronicus, Coriolanus. And I've asked my students to choose one of these claims and to see in what way it kind of enables certain insights into the plays or into South African or African political contexts, what factors vindicate the claim, and which readings are foreclosed, which possibilities are, are narrowed down, which nuances are suppressed by the claim. So really all I'm doing tonight uh, is, I hope, echoing what number, some of my brilliant second year students have uh, been doing, but I can promise I haven't cribbed from them because I haven't marked their essays yet. Um, but the point really, and I'll return to this again later, is that uh, surely by, by sheer fact of similar claims being made about other uh, Shakespeare plays, we already, I think, can trouble the idea that Julius Caesar is the African play. So the case for Shakespeare's African play. Um, what actually happens in Julius Caesar? Those of you who don't know the play have been wanting to find out. Well, I think you probably already know from the uh, South African and African examples that I've given you. Um, what we have in Julius Caesar is a play about the Roman Republic, which seems to be threatened by a man, Julius Caesar, who wants to gather uh, the popularity that he has into the power of the godlike figure of the emperor, and for the sake of republic and equality, uh, a group of conspirators, noblemen all get together and stab him publicly. And you would think, well done them, because they did this in the name of equality and, and freedom, liberty from tyranny, as they claim. Um, but things don't go quite as they were hoping. Um, and suffice to say that uh, after, of course, the famous uh, funeral speeches from Brutus and Antony, where it turns out the Roman people actually really did like Julius Caesar, and they did not support this assassination, as the conspirators hoped. Uh, violence breaks out in Rome. A lot of people are, are killed, casual bystanders and others. And then it's open warfare, kind of civil war in Rome. The upshot of which, the end result anyway, is that uh, eventually we have uh, an empire and an emperor. <laughs> so Julius Caesar is the moment where uh, Rome ceases being a republic and becomes an empire. So it's kind of, it's a, it's a failed attempt at establishing freedom. And the end result is, as the conspirators would have conceived of it, tyranny. Um, by the way, I wanna jump back one and just say, uh, if you don't know Coriolanus, all of these plays, the claim that I find most convincing, this is a lecture for another day, uh, is about Coriolanus in South Africa. Um, and you can ask Sarah Roberts about that as well, if you catch her afterwards. Um, okay, so what we have then is a pattern of idealism, revolution, violence, and then the reestablishment of tyranny. And this seems to be, if we fall into some of the familiar tropes about Africa, um, a story that can be mapped onto certain uh, national contexts in our continent. Um, the question is, 
Is Julius Caesar a play to inspire revolutionaries or a play to warn people against undertaking the kind of dramatic change that comes with, with regime, regime change, let's call it, with, with assassination? Um, so here we need to go back to that moment in 1959 where John Ghani met BBM Gledle. Um, so the context of Ghani's encounter with Gledle's also translation um, is it, it's three years after the play was published or the translation was public, published. And Kani's interpretation and recollection uh, of this is that the apartheid authorities prescribed the play to discourage students from resisting the absolute power of the state. So the thinking there would be the warning against revolution or, or resisting tyranny. Um, but Kani's teacher saw the potential for the play to inspire his students uh, and to make them think about liberty and freedom, uh, to teach it in a subversive way, kind of teaching it against the prescription on the, on the curriculum. Um, now, it's worth noting that this is a, a few years after the establishment of the Bantu Education Act in 1953. Um, and as a side note, the policy of Bantu education has a complicated relationship with translation in South Africa, because on the one hand, uh, the case would have been made and was made that Shakespeare should be removed from so-called Bantu schools on the grounds that teaching and learning Shakespeare would be, be purely bewildering to so-called hewers of wood and drawers of water in that Favudian um, uh, conception. Um, alternatively, the argument might have been made and was made that Shakespeare should remain in the curriculum, although this was not explicit, on the grounds that it would uh, confuse English second language or additional language students and thus inhibit their improved English, something that Eskim Pachlele and others wrote about in terms of the, the role of English as a kind of Promethean fire uh, and freedom, opportunity for freedom for Black South Africans. Maybe it was more a case of indifference. Uh, but whichever it was, for a decade or so prior to these kinds of considerations coming into play, uh, the insistence on separate schooling under the guise of tribal or ethnic affiliation led to support for African language educational resources. And thus, for example, to translations of Shakespeare. And this is a hypothesis of mine that uh, needs proper testing and would require lots of archival work if such archives exist. But you'll see just now when I show you another timeline, there was a great burst of translations of Shakespeare's plays into African languages um, in the 1950s and 1960s in South Africa. Uh, a number of those translations by school inspectors, former teachers, people who would have been involved in curriculum planning. Um, okay, end of digression. So, so what is the case that is made for this claim that uh, Julius Caesar is Shakespeare's African play? Most of the time, to be honest, it's just an appeal to authority. People say, John Carney says it, Ali Mazrui said it, Ken Temba said it, so it must be true. Um, now we all know better than to uh, fall into that trap, and yet we do time and again. Um, so uh, figures like Anthony Sampson and John Carlin, uh, who have quite substantial readerships across many publications or had, uh, a few hundred other journalists and dozens of scholars have all recycled this claim uh, based on the interest in Julius Caesar of uh, certain African scholars and, in some cases, statesmen. And here, of course, we have to look at the figure of Nelson Mandela and the role of Julius Caesar as it is perceived in the ANC liberation movement. Um, mostly these hinge around, uh, around Mandela um, and an appeal to his kind of unquestionable authority. So on the top right hand side there you see a, a photograph from the so called Robin Island Bible. Uh, this was a copy of the collected works of Shakespeare that was uh, passed around in secret between some of the Robin Island prisoners and signed by uh, many luminaries of our struggle, one of them um, in our Mandela in 1979, and he signed uh, the, the lines that Julius Caesar speaks before he is killed cowards die many times before their deaths the, the uh, valiant never taste of death but once. So it's a speech saying, um, I can't live in fear of death. I can't live in the shadow of death. Um, and of course, uh, if you know your Nelson Mandela history, these words seem to echo very strongly with the lines that stridently Mandela spoke 
uh, from the Dock at the Treason trial, um, saying, I fought against white domination, I fought against black domination. Uh, he hopes for uh, the ideal of equality to be achieved, and he hopes to live to see it come to fruition. But he says, if necessary, it's an ideal for which I'm willing to die. So this is great, because everybody who's looking for a connection will say, well, clearly, Nelson Mandela in 1979 was thinking about Julius Caesar. He still had this, his own speech from the, from the Dock at the Treason trial in mind. And it's, you know, that's, a, that's a fair claim. Um, but the only record we actually have of Mandela thinking about Shakespeare uh, when he was um, on trial uh, is a reference to Measure for Measure, where a character uh, advises another character, be absolute for death. You must be ready uh, for death. Uh, prepare yourself to die. Um, and so uh, where we have a, a connection, a Shakespeare connection for Mandela, it's not actually Julius Caesar. So it might seem like I'm being really pedantic, but part of my job as I see it is to kind of puncture some of the mythos uh, that has accumulated um, through some neat slippages and convenient uh, um, kind of cutting of corners with some of the, the facts. Um, so I want to emphasize that we should be wary of, of making inflated claims and cautious of the circular process by which Shakespeare authorizes Mandela, as he uh, did to our um, uh, colonizing friends of the global north, uh, who felt that if Mandela liked Shakespeare, he couldn't be a terrorist after all. Uh, and then, uh, in, in, after Mandela's death, Mandela gives a kind of saintly authorization to Shakespeare. And we can say, well, Shakespeare can't be colonial. He's not that bad because Nelson Mandela liked it. And this is a very dangerous logic, I think, to, to pursue. Um, and then, of course, we have Mandela the boxer. We'll come back to Mandela the boxer in a few minutes. For now, let's go further back in time to the ANC Youth League Manifesto in 1944. Um, and this I've titled this slide, When Mandela Quotes Shakespeare. Uh, uh, this is a, a sort of allusion to uh, the wonderful scholar Isabel Hofmeyer, colleague at Bits, um, who uh, many years ago wrote an article called Why Mandela Quotes Shakespeare. And it's a history of the Lovedale uh, Literary Society. Or was a debating society, Lovedale Literary Society, I think. Uh, and she gives us some background into why a figure like Mandela and many of his colleagues, um, black political leaders, black intellectuals, um, were steeped in the habit of quoting Shakespeare to illustrate a point, to punctuate an anecdote, to seal an argument, to entertain, to demonstrate your, um, your wisdom and, and knowledge. Um, and I want to ask the question, what happens when Mandela quotes Shakespeare, brackets, or does he? Because one of the things that people love to say is that Mandela gave uh, a final stamp of approval to the ANC Youth League Manifesto um, by quoting from Julius Caesar and, and the lines that Cassius speaks to Brutus. These are two of the conspirators at the beginning of the play. The fault, dear Brutus, is in not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. In other words, we can't blame the... Uh, the regime. We can't blame our oppressors, right? The fault is ours. It's time for us to claim our own future and destiny, which of course is a very neat summary of what the ANC Youth League Manifesto says. Um, These conditions have made the African lose all faith in all talk of trusteeship, trusteeship particularly by white liberals. He now elects to determine his future by his own efforts. He has realized that to trust to the mere good grace of the white man will not free him. And no nation, as no nation can free an oppressed group other than that group itself. Self-determination is the philosophy of life which will save him from the disaster he clearly sees on his way. Disaster to which discrimination, segregation, past laws and trusteeship are all ruthlessly and inevitably driving him. Now these are beautiful strident words. You don't need Shakespeare to make it sound better. And so I went back uh, to my colleague in historical papers here at Wits, Gabriela Mohale, uh, which, who, who has trusteeship of a different kind over a very rich archive. Um, and we looked at the typescript together. It's digitized and available. There is no appearance of Shakespeare in the typescript that was the founding uh, of, or the, that, was, that was prepared for the, the manifesto of the ANC Youth League. And it doesn't appear in various uh, official versions. Now, of course, it's possible that members in the ANC wanted to scrub the Shakespearean connection as happened to some degree with the Robin Island Bible. Um, but in fact, I would wager that if we were to look at the many extant copies of uh, the man manifesto from 1944, there wouldn't actually be that many of them that have this, this uh, gesture from Nelson Mandela um, declaring the manifesto to be viable because it has a Julius Caesar quote. 
So again, I'm sorry for being pedantic, um, but I want to make the point that even if it is there, Shakespeare is an adornment, an afterthought, a flourish, a stamp of authority. Julius Caesar is undoubtedly a shared point of reference for Mandela and his fellows. Um, but as I said, and as Isabel Hoffmeyer points out, he's there to illustrate and impress, to entertain and punctuate an argument. He's not there as a key driver of political vision. And in fact, the only reference to Julius Caesar in Nelson Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom is a comical scene in which boxing coach, coach Skipper Molozzi accuses boxer Jerry Malloy, who sought to break away from Molozzi's club and start a rival group of double crossing him as Brutus had betrayed Caesar. Who are Caesar and Brutus, my son asked. Before I could answer, someone said, aren't they dead? To which Skipper replied, yes, but the truth about the betrayal is very much alive. Um, so uh, we need to emphasize here that, that Shakespeare's role, insofar as he had one, and Julius Caesar's uh, place in the political imagination of significant figures in our intellectual and political history um, was not always earnest and serious and self-important. There needs to be a place for humor, a certain amount of parody and kind of cutting Shakespeare down to size. So this leads me to the case against, or at least some complicating factors or historical inconsistencies um, in these claims. First of all, we have to make the obvious point that Nelson Mandela was not a Julius Caesar figure. He did not seek absolute power. Um, and even Julius Nyerere, though he may have uh, ruled for a bit longer than others might have liked, um, did stand for election, albeit in a one party system. Um, so it's very difficult for us to try and kind of connect the characters uh, in the play to the historical figures. And in fact, lots of people who do that tend to slip between characters. So we have uh, John Carlin, do I have him? I don't have him down. Um, John Carlin has gone so far as to suggest that Julius Caesar is such a key text for South Africa's freedom fighters that it would be, quote, misguided to neglect the degree to which a play like Julius Caesar substantially informed their mental processes in, for instance, ultimately choosing negotiation over armed struggle. So Carlin says uh, it was Chris Harney who was the assassinated Caesar and um, Mandela knew the play so well that he didn't want to be like Antony, who was Caesar's ally and say, you know, cry havoc and let's slip the dogs of war. And he instead he chose peace and negotiation. And so Mandela kind of learned from Julius Caesar in this way, which again, doesn't make any sense if at other times Mandela is supposed to be Julius Caesar. Um, so there's this kind of loose uh, slippage that takes place. Something similar happened with Anthony Sampson. Many of you will know him as the editor of Drum, um, who at that stage, 30 years after he'd been Drum editor, was writing for The Observer in the UK, who wanted to assert Julius Caesar's relevance to South Africa in an article where he was bemoaning people wanting to take Shakespeare off the school curriculum. Um, and Sampson was very fond of equating, for example, Sophia Town with Elizabethan England. By implication, they're both undergirded by violence, maybe by a certain kind of not quite modernness. Uh, and in this, we might think that he was simply following the lead of writers he edited in Drum Magazine. Certainly, he could quote, quote uh, Lewis and Corsi, who said, it was the cacophonous swaggering world of Elizabethan England, which gave us the closest parallel to our own mode of existence, the cloak and dagger stories of Shakespeare. Um, but what happens is that people pick up on this and they uh, read Anthony Sampson's article and then they quote Anthony Sampson saying that Lewis and Corsi thought that Julius Caesar was Shakespeare's African play. So we add another kind of intellectual heavyweight to the claim when in fact this is not really uh, the case at all. Um, so while we're talking about Lewis and Corsi and, Corsi and drum writers, let's talk about Cantemba again. Uh, the drum writers of course can never be read straight. They're always uh, writing with a kind of ironic dry wit. Um, so Ken Temba is talking about Julius Caesar and violence and its connection to South Africa and violence. And he says what makes Africa's violence so unique is the uncanny sense that it is essentially of Africa in a way that is not necessarily unsympathetic. It is true to say that violence is the core and fiber of Africa's being. And this, those true Africans, the Negroes, Bantu, and Afrikaner fully understand. So the, the kind of cadence of that sentence leads us almost to forget the insertion of the word Afrikaner, where Cantember is very obviously arguing against the idea that there's something essentially violent about um, Africa by implication, black Africans. So the more we dig into Cantember's essay, the more we see the irony in his tone and how this works against taking the Shakespearean frame, frame uh, too seriously. Um, 
Now, Cantemba also is contriving uh, an analogy, as I suggested, to compare Julius Caesar to some of the Kosa uh, chieftains in the Eastern Cape and the Trans Sky. Um, but he also talks about uh, both Henry the Fourth plays and Henry the Fifth and Othello, and it's really just for the for the sake of his uh, kind of entertainment in the in the in the piece uh, that he mentions Julius Caesar first. Moreover, when he talks about violence, it turns out he doesn't actually mean what we understand by violence: uh, rape and robbery, murder and massacre. He also thinks that violence includes jokes and ditties, gaudy dress and extravagant swagger, uh, ferocious religiosity, and so on. So uh, what I'm suggesting is that it's very dangerous for us to say Candemba made the claim that Julius Caesar is an African play, because there's so much more nuance and irony in, in Temba's claim. And uh, what we end up doing is simply reinforcing certain essentialist notions about Africa as violent or as doomed to have failed revolutions that will be, uh, that will be followed by, by a tyranny. Um, Okay, I think I might be running out of time. So let me jump forward a little bit to some of the other uh, received wisdom that uh, we can often encounter about Shakespeare in South Africa. Lewis and Corsi said that Julius Caesar fits the African mold. We know that's not true. Can Temba translated Julius Caesar into Kosa? No, he didn't. He wrote a couple of paragraphs where he made a comparison, but it sounds much better to say he translated it. So people do. Robert Sabukwe translated Macbeth into Isizu. No, he did not. Robert Sabukwe always said that he would have liked to translate Shakespeare into Isizulu, and he was a, um, a, a professor of African languages here at Wits before he uh, was imprisoned on Robben Island. Um, but again, uh, what's, what happens, what, this, what these kinds of anecdotes serve to demonstrate is Shakespeare's significance. We have the universal Shakespeare, the bard of Avon, the genius, the man whose works were for all time, not for a single age, and we forget the details about our South African figures. I don't want to sound too parochial in saying this, but um, you can go onto the website of the Nobel um, Committee, uh, where a writer called Anders Hallengren rehashes this false claim, uh, as well as the idea that Julius Nyerere was named after Julius Caesar. No, he wasn't. Julius Caesar was born Kambarage Nyerere, and he took the name Julius when he was baptized as a Catholic after St. Julius. Um, Julius Caesar was translated into Zulu in the 1930s. No, it wasn't. Julius Caesar was translated into Setswana in the 1930s. And when we make the mistake, as even Ali Mazrui did in 1960, of quoting somebody called Lyndon Harries, who was at the University of London at the time, uh, and, to, and we conflate Setswana and Isizulu, we start to accept the colonial imagination that sees Isizulu as a kind of metonym, or the Amazulu as a metonym for all forms of blackness in Africa. Um, so again, I might seem like I'm on a bit of a soapbox here, but it's really important that we, that we uh, puncture some of these claims. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm simply going to point you to Ali Mazrui's essay and to say that he too, although he makes the claim, dials it back in his own essay and says, well, we have to be careful of looking for too close an analogy when we do this kind of work. Um, what can we learn from Ali Mazrui? Well, this is the kind of uh, the, the, the key takeaway that I'd like you to bear in mind. So I'll bring my comments to a conclusion, although I'll still speak for a few minutes if my facilitators will allow me. Um, Nyerere, Nyerere talks about blank verse and rhyming verse. Uh, now, um, sorry, not Nyerere, Mazrui talks about this in his essay. Nyerere staged a really uh, controversial intervention in the history of Kiswahili poetry by writing in blank verse following Shakespeare's verse form, rather than in rhyming verse, which is the traditional uh, verse form for Kiswahili poetry. Um, and because of his status as Julius Nerede, um, this intervention was kind of allowed or accommodated or tolerated where it might have been poo-pooed by purists and, and rejected. Um, and so uh, what we have here is access into a really interesting moment in the history of Kiswahili as a language of literary creation. Um, which I think is much more interesting than simply saying Julius Caesar is Shakespeare's African play. Likewise, we can think about the role of Nyerere's translation in affirming uh, Kyunguja, the, um, Kiswa, sorry, the Zanzibar dialect of Kiswahili, um, which is also a significant moment when we think about languages across the East African region. So if you want to learn more, please tune into episodes one and two of Shake the Sword, where I interview Serena Talento and Kimani Njogu, two fantastic scholars who talk about this. I told you I'd be doing some advertising. Um, and you'll discover that it's really much more interesting when we consider the nuances of translation, the idiosyncratic choices by translators, rather than simply seeking to affirm a convenient idea of Shakespeare being at home 
in South Africa or Africa. Um, Plaiki, likewise, we can connect to Nyerere because the story of Plaiki's Julius Caesar is a story about Setswana orthography, maybe not of interest to you if you're not uh, a Setswana speaker. Um, but in fact, uh, um, Plaiki's lost translations, he translated uh, at least three other um, Shakespeare plays, may have been lost because he didn't get the approval of a group of uh, white language profs who felt that he got the orthography of Setswana wrong. Um, and so that to me is also a much more interesting history to pursue. And you can see the names of the scholars there who have um, covered this territory, Ryan Willen, Dana Dana, Shole Shole, Sabatan Bomokai, Deborah Seddon, is a huge body of scholarship around uh, Plaiki and his translations. Unfortunately, all that filters through is the stamp of approval that says somebody who founded the ANC like Shakespeare and Julius Caesar. And mea culpa, I am guilty of that. I wrote, I ran an entire second year course about Shakespeare and the ANC. So we all have our, um, <laughs> our errors to make up for. Um, okay, so uh, briefly, an expanded timeline to fill in some of the blanks from what we looked at earlier. Um, it turns out that as important as Sol Plaiki -like was, he might not have been the first person to publish a translation of Shakespeare into an African language. That honor probably belongs to the largely forgotten E.T. Johnson from Nigeria and Sierra Leone, uh, Iwi Ere to Julius Caesar, translated into Yoruba and published sometime in the 1930s, we're not quite sure. This play has been digitized and is hidden in plain sight uh, on the website of the Bodleian Library. So if you ever want a concrete example of the you know, function of colonial knowledge transfer, that's a, um, a, a useful one. It will soon be part of the Sol Plaiki archive for Shakespeare in African languages that the, the Tsukina Shaka Center is, is building. Um, but I make this point just to remind us again uh, to try and find that balance between uh, a not parochial, but a committed interest in the history of South African languages uh, and also recognizing connections and parallels with uh, scholars and translators and writers and theater makers across the African continent, uh, where the connection is not some putative shared history, which is an African pattern of liberty, violence, and tyranny, but instead is a shared connection, which has to do with uh, the um, prescription of translations of Julius Caesar on educational curricula, or, um, the kind of quirky interests of people who then became uh, famous uh, figures. We might remember that um, Nyerere did his translation as a so-called entertainment or distraction while he was still a student uh, studying in Scotland. He didn't initially undertake the translation as a kind of African nationalist gesture, although it would subsequently become one. And I've also slipped in there Kei Masinga, uh, um, a famous uh, radio announcer from the 1950s who translated huge chunks of Shakespeare into Isizulu. Um, so uh, this is the, the, the work of the, of the Tsikina Shaka Center is to try and bring a lot of this kind of lost translation, lost to these lost translations uh, back into the public eye to make it digitally available so that we don't risk uh, losing them on dusty shelves of libraries or um, fires. Uh, and also to get us to think about some of the difficulties of complicity and resistance. That figure on the right-hand side is CNM Patudi, who translated uh, Julius Caesar into Sepedi. There he is wearing his chains of office. Uh, he was um, the, uh, I forgot, oh, the chief minister of Leboa, uh, the, uh, the Bantustan uh, in the north of South Africa between 1973 and 1987. Um, so how do we understand a figure like CNM Patudi? Was he a collaborator, a stooge, an impimpi, a, a, a kind of functionary of the apartheid government, um, a mission school product educated into false consciousness, or was he someone who tried to work with an within an undefeatable system to use his limited influence, uh, for example, negotiating the return of Eskim Pashele to South Africa, for which Vitsis have um, to say thanks. And of course, the role of his translation of Julius Caesar and its prescription on school curricula in that process uh, gets us to think about questions of complicity and resistance. Um, so I propose then to spend a lot more time working on the lives of the translators, borrowing on that phrase, the lives of the poets. Usually we know about poets biographies, translators are often forgotten. Translation is understood to be invisible work, but really uh, it shouldn't be. So um, the TCC is trying to bring to light these hidden and lost translations. Uh, to talk in biographical terms as well as bibliographical terms. So we 
kind of bring these forgotten translators back to life. Some of them, um, like K.E. Masinga, who you see on the right-hand side there as a radio announcer, are already actually quite uh, widely written about, but not as Shakespeare translators. Um, and finally, I want to emphasize that uh, the aim is to connect uh, these lives of the translators to the afterlives of the translations. In other words, to think about these translations as part of a living tradition that has directly or indirectly uh, affected and influenced the work of creative practitioners today. So Cesar uh, was based on um, Pleike's translation of Julius Caesar. Some of you might know that production of probably 15 or 20 years ago now. Emmy Caesar, um, a version of Julius Caesar written by Lekon Balogun, who's a, an affiliate member of the Tsikinia Shaka Center, and various other new translations that we might uh, promote or critique or analyze uh, and understand them as part of this uh, long and rich history. So finally, I'm gonna stop talking now, but hopefully in a year or two, there will be a book or some books. Uh, and I've got the little, a little word cloud there to gesture towards the fact, if it's not obvious to you by now, that although I have lots of interest in this area, my linguistic repertoire is embarrassing. And so I need to lean on the expertise of my colleagues, some of whom are in the School of uh, languages and literature here at WITS, uh, some of whom have written about these figures before. So I will allow that to be the, the last slide. Your names can hover over the, I'm afraid, lowercase uh, words there. Some of them are translators, some of them are uh, places, some of them are the scholars who will be writing about these translations. Uh, and at least it, it, it remains for me only to say that amongst the translators here, most of them also did a Macbeth and uh, Merchant of Venice, along with the Julius Caesar. So hopefully there'll be books, plural, down the line, and that will simply demonstrate that we should always be cautious of the claim that Julius Caesar is Shakespeare's African play. Thank you.